Welcome back to Squawk in the Street. I'm David Faber at the NASDAQ market site with two guests this morning. Lowell McAdam is the chairman and CEO of Verizon. Wendell Weeks, the chairman and CEO of Corning. Together, the two companies announcing this morning a new pact under which Verizon is agreeing to pay $1.05 billion for a three-year minimum purchase agreement with Corning for the next generation of what they call optical solutions. What does that mean? Well, it means an awful lot of fiber to help uh, improve Verizon's 4G LTE coverage and perhaps most importantly, speed the deployment of 5G services. And that's what we're here to talk about in part. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Yeah, good morning. Um, why are you buying all this fiber? Well, David, we viewed fiber as the cornerstone building block for the network, the next generation network. And that network is going to look very different than what we've built in the past. Uh, if you look at 2G and third generation and fourth generation of wireless, it was about capacity and throughput. Fifth generation is about those things. Uh, we're going to see a hundred times faster throughput, but we're going to see things like latency of a network that the network will go out and come back and respond in less than the time it takes to blink your eye. We're going to see 10 times the battery life that we've seen in the past. That opens up a whole new set of applications for consumers and enterprise, but you can't do it if you don't have fiber deep into the network compared to what we've done in the past. Right. We call that, I guess it's called densification, one of the words that's used here. And, you know, Wendell, I would think this is beneficial to Corning's business overall. The need to bring this fiber, frankly, as close to the end user as possible. That last little bit is wireless and is 5G, but the rest of it is going to be a lot of your fiber, correct? Absolutely. Uh, we invented the first low loss fiber over 40 years ago, and actually Lowell's companies were among the very first customers for fiber in the world. And then they were the first folks to do a widespread deployment of fiber to the home. And now they're going to be the first folks to do a truly 5G ready wireless network. And what it basically means is compared to fiber to the home, you're looking here at somewhere between two and six times more fiber to do an, a wireless network right than it takes to do fiber to the home. Why not right. just take the fiber all the way to the home like you have with Fios and just take all this capacity? Why? Mm. Does it save you a lot of money to have that 5G that spe mm. for that last little bit mm -hmm. into the home? Yeah, absolutely. And so let me give you an example of what this network's going to look like. When we deployed Fios, we would run a strand into a neighborhood, a cable that had maybe yeah. six or eight strands in it. Now we're going to drop off six or eight strands to every street light in every neighborhood. So that allows you to deliver a gigabit of throughput into the home, and it allows you to do things like intelligent transportation grids, intelligent electricals, uh, electro, uh, uh, electric grid management, water system management. You hear a lot about autonomous cars and things like that today. That does not work without 5G. Uh, but that's a long way away, isn't it, Lowell? No, I don't think so. So, David, we're going to be launching uh, 11 markets this year, this summer, 200 cell sites where we're going to deploy this architecture over 5G. And you will see, this is one of those, if you build it, they will come. But that's just fixed wireless broadband, isn't it? Isn't that just for somebody who's basically now going to get a signal wirelessly the way they do via their broadband on a wire right now? They'll get that. It's not for these other applications. You're no, I think it is for these other. I mean, look, the early stages will be those sorts of applications. But we're already, Wendell and I just returned from a trip to Korea where you see what they're doing to, to manage the rail system, what they're doing to have consumers experience the, the Olympics. And I'll give you an example for enterprise. You, know, you can put on a set of goggles and through a digital twin in 5G, you can go in and do maintenance on a turbine or a jet engine or a manufacturing line without ever having to go into the facility. All that is available through augmented reality and because the network can deliver such capacity and be so responsive to a customer's needs. Uh, are you going to be able to deliver what you need to? Do you have the capacity right now? My understanding is there may actually be not a glut, but a shortage of fiber. That's right. Well, that's why we're also announcing that we are expanding the world's largest and lowest cost fiber optic plant right in North Carolina. Uh, adding another quarter of a billion dollars to the two billion dollars we've got invested today and uh, adding about 10% to our optical communications team and workforce. So 
we've actually got to put up some fresh steel to make this happen. Did you uh, mention that to the president when you go to his manufacturing summits? I know you've been to a couple. Probably well, like and I will news. invite him to come down maybe for the groundbreaking. Creating jobs in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, Lowell, people look at Verizon right now and they wonder about the growth trajectory that mm -hmm. 5G will present, in part mm -hmm. because, of course, Verizon's had a very competitive run lately mm -hmm. uh, where your earnings have been constrained. In fact, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at 2015 numbers that are going to be very similar to what analysts estimate for 2018. When do the benefits of what you're talking about here start to actually accrue for your investor base? Yeah, we see this starting to accrue in 18, David. So that's why we're out there with the trials now. Obviously, it'll take some time to deploy this, uh, but we should, we'll be commercial next year, and we'll be moving hard over the three-year part of this deal. Now, one thing we're looking for, and if you compare the, the U.S. position versus other parts of the world, is the administration helping with infrastructure placement, you know, whether they do an infrastructure bill, but even what Chairman Pai of the FCC is doing this week, as an example, is important to us. It's working with the communities to make sure that the, the conduits are available, that, uh, that uh, facilitates the small cell placement, that puts a shot clock on the amount of time before permits are, are approved in the municipalities. Those sorts of things will help us move it forward and then deliver it to the bottom line. At a, at a more rapid pace. But you're talking about, what, 10,000 different small cell sites in a city like New York alone. Yeah, so if you look at, uh, and by the way, we've, we've learned over the last several years as we've been manufacturing capacity for our 4G network how to do that. But to your point, we have about 60,000 very large towers around the country right now and about 13,000 small cells. When we get rolling in some of these towns like Boston where we're deploying today, we'll put 8,000, 10,000 small cells. I mean, literally the size of the palm of your hand. And that'll be delivering these sorts of services to the customers and the, the consumer as well as the enterprise. Now, they're, you're not, they're not your only customer, but are they ahead of everybody else, Wendell? With the network that they're talking about deploying, I think they really are world leaders. They did this in fiber to the home, too. And uh, what Verizon's always been is an innovative leader when it comes to networks. And then we typically see rest of world actually following their architectures over time. You know, it, it occurs to me that your main competitor, AT&T, some would say, seems to be running away from its business to a certain extent with large acquisitions, whether it's DirecTV or AT&T, where you seem to be embracing what you are. Um, which leads me to ask, are you going to make a large acquisition but have it focused on infrastructure to help this 5G deployment? You did say, apparently, uh, Lowell, to a number of analysts late last year, uh, that there was industrial sense for Verizon to buy charter. Is that true? Yeah, well, it gets back to this exact deal that we're doing today. As we've looked at companies around the U.S., there's nobody building to the architecture that we're talking about. So instead of maximum 144 strands of fiber, in Boston today, we're placing 1,700 strand fiber. So nobody has that. So uh, a cable company would have customers, obviously, would have uh, infrastructure, conduits, pole attachments, those things are all good. But it doesn't have that kind of fiber. Right. It's not going to do you any good. Right. So, it? well, uh, the, the network investment is going to be the cornerstone, as I said in the very beginning. That's why a deal with Corning like this today is so transformational for our company. So you don't seem to be saying no, though, to a large acquisition that would allow you to advance more quickly. I mean, no, you know, I, there's been plenty of speculation yeah. about Charter. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think our shareholders expect us to look at every option, but I would tell you right now we haven't seen the architectural fit and we haven't seen a willing seller and a willing buyer that have a meeting of the minds. So that's where things stand. Well, when you say architectural fit then, so it doesn't necessarily work? I mean, if you were to... No, from a fiber perspective, nobody. Whether you're a fiber company or you're a cable company, you don't have the architecture that we're talking about today. So then you just got to build it all yourself? Well, that's where we're doing. And yeah, is we'll that see. included in the $18 billion in CapEx you spend, or is that going to ramp up over time as 5G becomes even more of a reality? Well, I think it depends on how 5G becomes a reality. So it's well within our, our stated guidance on capital today. 
And we'll see what these trials this summer, this summer are going to be very informative to us as we become uh, commercial in the next year and we see all of these applications come online, uh, then we'll, we'll uh, decide where we go from there. And Wendell, when you look at the 5G world that Lowell is right. describing, we're still a long way away, though, from an autonomous car grid running on the cloud via 5G, right? <laughs> I mean, every, uh, when is the date here when you really start to think we're going to see true deployment of 5G? Well, I think what's... I think you're going to see 5G deploy very rapidly. I guess used in, right. a, in, a, used in, in a more robust way is my question. I think the way I tend to think about the network uh, is what Lowell's doing is his business case works around just doing 4G densification, improving your quality of service, improving all the different options you get on 4G. And then on top of that, he's able to scale 5G and he's able to bring that type of bandwidth as a service to each city as it goes. And I think you're going to see revenue layer as basically everything you see from the tech companies today fundamentally is built around the assumption that we're going to have this type of bandwidth. Without this type of infrastructure, you're not going to have any of that GWIZ it's about, stuff. It's about commercial applications tech. as much as anything else, though, in terms of yeah. revenue producing eventually, right? Sure. But right. Uh, you know, I remember a conversation that I had with Steve Jobs when we were right. on 3G and we were offering 5 megabits of service. And he, once I said we'd be up around 15 with 4G, he said, I got it. We'll build it. Uh, when now we're going to be saying we'll deliver 100 times that 10 average, a gigabit. People will build to that. And you see the applications already. Sure. When, when we went to Korea a few weeks ago, you see people with virtual reality participating in the hockey game, you know, using the, a gigabit of service and downloading video on high-speed trains. I, I think, honestly, David, the biggest limiting factor for us is whether our education system turns out enough engineers and entrepreneurs to build to this. Because if you look at China today, they're doing 2 million engineers a year. The U.S. is around 200,000. We can't even fill 20% of the jobs that we're projecting in the next decade. So we've got to get that right as well as the technology. All right. Lowell, so many other questions, of course. But I know we're going to do this again fairly soon, <laughs> perhaps, and then get an opportunity to talk about Unlimited and everything else. You report earnings in a couple of days yes, anyway. Yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, we'll be focused on that. But, gentlemen, thank you. For hey, being here you, today. Thank you. Appreciate come down it. and visit us and come see a, a great big fiber plant. Uh, okay. I okay. will do that. Congratulations. I will do you, that. Buddy. <laughs> thank you. Uh, for now, though, I will say thank you. Wendell Weeks, okay. uh, Lowell McAdams, send it back to you guys uh, in the studio.